come. My guest today is a young woman who was forced out of the Christian university she attended because of a bad decision to appear in an adult video. She was so discouraged, she gave up on God and moved to California where she became a very famous adult film star. She remained active in the porn industry until a young man convinced her to start a new life with him. So she left that life behind and all the money that went with it. However, her past still torments her with feelings of shame and rejection. But most of all, because of what happened to her, she feels that God and the church let her down. You're going to meet this young woman right now, and we're going to help her move beyond her troubled past and help her regain her faith in God and His grace. I'm Creflo Dollar, and this is your world. My guest today is trying to start a new life with her boyfriend and their one-year-old baby away from the mistakes of her past and the judgment of the world. Now, would you please join me in a very warm welcome, Reagan, to the show, to your world today. Welcome to the show and thank you so much for, for being here today. We call it your world because I find it instructional, I, I find it informative, and I find that it strikes a chord with people when we allow our guests to uh, take us into your world. Let's start when the sexual abuse started at age six and walk us through that. So my mom, she was, she was a very good mom at the very beginning, but once I was like six years old, she started messing around with this guy and she was like getting really bad on drugs. So my grandparents had took her to court and um, from what I was told whenever I was younger, she didn't want to take a drug test so she just waived her rights to me. Mm. And whenever my mom, she didn't want me, that's what I feel like. It's just like, why? So I would always try to be with my mom no matter what. So when we, I was always taking her side whenever people would talk about her and say she was doing all this stuff. And she started dating that guy, Jerry, and we were getting to see her. I noticed things weren't right. And he would be like riding in the car with me and like he would have his, his hand like in the middle of my thigh. And then it like progressed from there. Like he would put like um, porn on in the TV um, before school when my mom wasn't there, like if maybe she had to go to work or something early and like. So he would play porn when you were about what, five? Six, six or six or seven. I was like probably in first grade. He never like went any further than just touching me and like making me watch stuff with him. It's still called abuse. You were far too young to have been put into situations like that, having your whole mental and spirit open to, to porn, all of, that is, all of that is abuse. And I think it's important for our audience to recognize what abuse is, whether it's verbal, emotional, sexual. There had to be a lot of emotional pressure. I wanna even go so far as to say trauma on you as a six, yeah. six year old definitely took away a lot of my childhood because I was always the one who was trying to make sure my sisters like were okay 
she stayed with him for a very, very long time. Like she went back and forth with him. No matter what happened, she, he abused her, she abused him. It was never good. It was always very toxic between them two. So how long did the abuse last with you from six years old to about what, when you were a preteen or what? Yeah, so it stopped with that whenever my mom got, when my, we got taken away from my mom. It was pretty, no, like nothing for a while. And my half sister's dad had moved us to another city. We left living with my grandparents half the time and were with him for the whole time. All of a sudden in eighth grade, I just started feeling really weird. I just remember like hearing clicks, like, you know, like whenever you take a picture on your phone, it makes that, that shutter noise. Then I noticed that he was taking pictures of me. Every time I would bend over, or if I was wearing short shorts and I was doing the dishes or I was cleaning, and I told my stepmom, like, my dad's taking pictures of me from behind and I'm scared of him and he's been like coming in my room at night. One time at the old house before we had moved, he had came in from being out at night and I woke up and he was like on top of me. And I was like, dad, and he was like, oh, I thought you were Gina, like saying her name. And I told her all these things. As soon as he got home, she told him, like, this is what Reagan, this is what Reagan's saying, you know? Reagan, I'm, I'm so sorry you had to go through, through that. I mean, my heart just, you know, to hear this story, it's so disturbing to know you had to go through it. I thank God for his grace that you made it out. But the story goes a little further now as yeah. a result of this. Well, uh, that went even past that. I didn't get out of that house until I was 17. Wow. And it had went further. Like when she had told him, he took me on a drive in the truck and was like, like, ne like nailing me down, like telling me like, the, like cussing at me, saying all these things, like, why would you say all this? You know, like hitting me in my forehead with his fingers and like, you know, pushing on me and stuff. But I like let it go. But then it went on to, I always wanted to be a bodybuilder and I wanted a bodybuilding.com account. And he's like, okay, well we can make one for you, but I'll run it because there's creeps, there's creeps on there. I was like, okay, so he had me put on a swimsuit and he took pictures of me. And then that kept going on and on and on. Then he would order outfits off of the internet. He's like, oh, I bought this for Gina, but I need you to try it on for me to see if it fits her. And so I would try it on it, but it was lingerie. Is Gina your mom? My stepmom. Stepmom, okay. Yeah. And then he would get me to drink and he would like tell me, oh, don't be a pansy. Oh, drink this, like, you know, like, pretty much pressuring me into drinking alcohol to the point where I would black out. And I really don't remember like a lot of things that happened, but it started going on to him, like having me dance for him and having me give him lap dances and like telling me, oh. Oh, your stepfather? Yeah, telling me, oh, move your hand over. Let me see your boobs. And I would like try to make up something and say like, no, I don't, I don't want to, like, they're ugly, like, blah, 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 like, say something. Reagan, let me ask you something. I want to make sure that, that I'm following you and our, our audience following you. You went from your biological mother back to your father, who you later on found out was not your biological father? Yeah. So you're staying with your... Um, Half-sister's dad. Yeah, and his wife. Yeah. Okay, and not your biological mother and father. Right. I don't know my biological dad. Okay. And, and this abuse, I mean, this, this, is, this is like crazy. I mean, who does that? That is just so abusive. How did it take you to this point where you're going through all of this abuse and you end up in, was it California? Yeah, so I left his house to live with my grandparents and I had went to go try out for the wrestling team at Wayland Baptist, which is the university that I was going to. So now we're at the Christian University? Mm-hmm. Okay. And I and had you went to try for the what? Wrestling, the wrestling team. team. Yeah. So you, the, you're a wrestler? Yeah. <laughs> mess with you. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And they had let me sign with them. So that summer, after my first semester at Wayland, I was being like a promoter for a club in Dallas, just a regular club. And the owner of the hotel um, at the Crown Plaza was hosting this thing called Exotica. What, I didn't really know what that was, but it's like pretty much like a, like, a, like a sex convention. 
but I wasn't like doing anything. I was just hosting the after parties. But um, they had put me and another girl into the finals round of this competition, like on the stage for Miss Exotica. We were like dancing and stuff, and then like I crowd surfed, and then I won like five hundred dollars. And there was like a video of it. And when I had went to school the, after that summer had happened, that was like everywhere. Like the, the video. Yeah, and they're like, oh, she's she's doing porn, like blah, blah, and I was like, no, I'm not. Like, I didn't, I was just hosting the event. Like, I didn't do, I don't do that. But from that event, I got, like, a lot of people, like, talking to me and, you know, telling me, oh, we'll fly you out here and we'll pay you. So there was this thing, it was just a solo thing. It was just by myself, not with anybody else. And so I was like, okay, cool. So I went and I did that. That's when everything went bad. Like, I didn't, when I had went there, I didn't know that it was gonna be like that. Like, I thought it was just gonna be like, maybe just some lingerie and like no, no, no bra or something. But it was like me, like, he's like, every little shoot was like more and more, him telling me to do more and more stuff. And so I don't even know like how, like the pictures or anybody like found out. Only two people knew about that. So it had to be one of the two who told everybody else that I had done this. And then it just like spread like wildfire through the whole school. All the teachers, like if I was missing um, a class to go do something, it was penalty. Like all of them hated, like started, I felt like started hating me. Like the teachers wouldn't even look at me. They wouldn't even talk to me if I asked for like, um, you know, some extra help or something. It's the, oh, it's in your book. It just started going like that. And so I was just like, what's the point of me even being here? Like I'm asking for help. Like I'm trying to fix my grades. I'm trying to get better with my relationship with God. And everybody's just pushing me, pushing me out. Like not being loving and welcoming. And like my family had found out about me doing that. And obviously they weren't very happy about that at all. And I had just felt like a big disappointment and the opportunity to go to California, it came and I just took it. Like I left all my stuff in my dorm room and I packed one suitcase and I just left and I never came back. You know, hearing your story, uh, did you feel hopeless? And as a result of feeling hopeless when this opportunity came from California, it was like, who cares anyway? I might as well go and make some yeah. money. I felt like a burden to everybody. So I just was like, I can just take care of myself. So what was the thing, once you got involved in, in the industry, what was the thing that convinced you that this is not for me and I need to get out of it? Well, from like the first, the first thing I did, I had like left, and that whole night, like I was crying. Like, I was just like, what did I do? Like what is wrong with me and like one of the girls that was in the house I was staying at she like made me she kind of just made me feel okay with it she's just telling me like people have sex for free all the time like they go on dates with people and they have sex with them and like you're not doing it for free you're you're getting paid for it so in a way you're you're holding yourself to a higher standard and what she told me that's just kind of the attitude that I gained for it and it was so much deception in that. Yeah, very much. And then it got to the point where I couldn't do it and then feel okay with myself. So I started drinking, man. I was drinking a lot, like way too much for somebody my, my size at all. And I was starting to dibble dabble into cocaine and Molly to make myself feel happy and to make myself feel good. Then I would just- Cover up all the pain? Yeah. And then all the money that I was making, I was spending it on like drugs and alcohol and going out and you know trying to buy friends pretty much because I knew none of these people liked me like they only wanted to party with me like I was like the good time Mike kind of person like nobody really didn't really took the time to get to know me for me and I guess that kind of made me even worse like I'm in this city all by myself like I can't go like in my head I was like I can't go back home because everybody's just going to be ashamed of me like you know 
A lot of stuff going on up there. Yeah, I just was like, a lot of times I would just be in the car just just crying. Like, what, like, I just, I just kept saying, why? Like, why, why, why is this, why am I doing this? Like, I, I was just so confused. And whenever I had met my baby's father, he was like, kind of like my saving grace. Like, I had been in a relationship with this person prior, before that, and he had like beat me up really bad, you know? And so he was like there, he protected me. And I was on like, at that time, I had, was on Molly for like five days straight. Like I wouldn't get out of his bed. I just stayed right there, like just taking it, taking it, taking it. And he just looked at me and he said, you need, like, that's enough. Like, that's, we just need to stop. And I don't know. Something from him just saying that just made me like, whoa, like somebody actually cares about my well-being. Like somebody doesn't want me to be like a mushroom in, in this bed. <laughs> you know what it was? And that's what this show is all about. It was God's grace. You could have gone one day and probably, and even been dead. With everything that you've gone through, you've kind of taken us through this story, and it is a sad one. But even in the midst of everything that you've gone through from six until that particular place, and been let down at Christian University and mocked and not gotten the treatment that Christians should have given you, but the grace of God is God's unmerited, undeserved favor, coming to you to give you what you didn't deserve. and. Jesus doesn't condemn us. He doesn't judge us. He doesn't say, I don't want to have anything to do with you, but just right when you don't think you deserve anything, you see that saving grace that shows up and says, you know what, even though you don't deserve it, I'm going to do something good to you, not because you've been good, because I'm just good and I want to show you goodness, <laughs> you know? And that's the grace of God. Yeah. That's the grace of God. I got a question. With everything you took us through, you took us on a journey here. What were you searching for? What, what was missing? What were you hoping to find? A purpose. I a, wanted a to, purpose? I wanted to know why I was here. On the planet? Yeah, like, what's the point of me being here? Does anybody understand what I'm feeling? Like, can anybody really, really love me? I don't know if pe really people, people understood, like, how sad and angry I was. Like, I didn't really talk about it that much, but how much I just didn't understand why all the things that happened to me happened. Well, you know, there are basic human needs that every human uh, needs to have, and one of them is to have an understanding of my significance and my purpose in life. There are lots of uh, people who are watching this broadcast right now can relate with you. They're trying to figure out why am I here? Yeah, I what am I just supposed felt like to do? I was just a body. Yeah, uh, does anybody care? And, and I think that's where we, we come in and, and really minister to the fact that you can do a lot of things to try to find happiness. You can, people can do a whole lot of wrong things trying to find happiness. But there's a place in your heart that God put only for him to abide. And I believe with all my heart, until we make Jesus the Lord of our lives, we're never gonna really experience what real happiness is. And I can assure you that you were put here for a purpose. You were called for a reason. There's an assignment and a mission for your life. And a lot of times we have to go through, when we don't know any better, we have to go through rough patches in life to try to finally get to that place where we can discover the will of God for our lives. You are significant to God. You are loved by God. I'm sad to recognize that Christians that you've encountered, they had an opportunity. They had an opportunity to be living epistles, an opportunity to show the love of Jesus Christ, his care and his concern. I don't know what it is with some Christians, we just miss out on an opportunity. I think we have to be careful as Christians not to become so self-righteous that we don't understand that self-righteousness is unrighteousness. And it's when you look at somebody else's life and you say, well, at least I hadn't done that and you're comparing yourself with somebody else's mistakes, that's self-righteousness. Everybody has an issue, which means we should be very ready to help minister to someone else when we see them going through. But I think sometimes Christians come to the point where 
I don't know, they become so judgmental and so self-righteous that they forget that uh, if it were not for Jesus, we would all be in hell. We're one Jesus away from being in hell. And if you take Jesus away, we all in hell, you know? Yeah. But because Jesus is now involved in the equation, we don't have to. And I am telling you, you mark my words. Everything that you've gone through, it may sound and look like a mess, but Jesus knows how to take your mess and turn it into a masterpiece. <laughs> I, I believe that, I believe that. And the Bible says, he that believeth in him shall not be put to shame. You don't have to live all of your life in the shame of your past. Jesus died and shed his blood so he can deal with and forgive you of your uh, past sins, your future sins, and your present sins. And here's the big thing, is when we don't value ourselves, it becomes very difficult for other people to value us. And you have to live with this. Nobody has the right to devalue me. Nobody. And from this point on, I want to encourage you to make that a, a, a living part of your life. Nobody gets to devalue me. I am valuable. And those people who refuse to value you, you don't need those people in your life devaluing you. You don't need them. You're valuable. You're valuable. And it's not too late. You are prime and ready <laughs> to receive all that God has to offer. He's just waiting on you to say yes. Sometimes your pain and your testimony can be turned around to be used as a tool to rescue somebody else's life. Not everybody could have gone through what you've gone through, but you made it, baby. And it didn't destroy you. It didn't destroy you. And so now you have this opportunity to take what you know, not what you read, to take what you know, not what you studied a course and thing, to take what you know, and with conviction and passion, you'll be able to now come and rescue people when you were not rescued. To be able to come in and minister to people when you were not ministered to. And I believe with all my heart as I sit here with this wrestler, <laughs> I am prophesying to you right now that the best is yet to come. <laughs> the best is yet to come. You, you hear what I'm saying? Yeah. You're not just a, some nobody that's just been through a whole lot of abuse. You are a message and you are a ministry in preparation that will go and rescue somebody else's life. And I believe that the grace of God is on your life and that grace is going to increase in your life. You watch you watch, you watch. <laughs> I will. Yeah, yeah. Don't you appreciate our guest today? You know, I talk about the grace of God every week on this program, and there's nothing you have done that disqualifies you from receiving God's love and the good he has in store for you. No, you may not deserve it, I understand that, but that's the point. Grace is God's unmerited, unearned favor that is extended to you. Now, this could be the day that you finally stop trying to justify your actions, stop living in shame and receive grace that God has for you and that God has waiting for you. Now, before I go, I hope you'll share your own story with us online at yourworldwithcreflo.com or stay connected with me on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. I'll see you next time right here on Your World. As Christians, we should strive to share God's love and to everybody we meet. And our church and other Christian institutions should be a place of safety where those who have made mistakes can come and experience the unmerited, undeserved favor of God. I believe that God can heal. I believe that God can recover and deliver you. I believe that God can make a way where there is no way. No. I want you to notice something. I said that as Christians, we should be ready to minister when we have that opportunity. 